Hey, Lyle. Hey, Dr. Wheeler. How goes it today? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. Hey, I got a question in uh, in QM um, about yeah, sure. assignments. Um, I'm almost finished with the uh, harmonic oscillator stuff. I've got, I think, two more problems on that, that problem set. So uh -huh. I should have to you really soon. Um, but after that, I don't see another like official looking problem set. I see another one that's a list of exercises in the next section, but it didn't, I didn't know. Oh, yeah, the, uh, that's, that's a problem set. Yeah, do okay. the exercises. All right. Um, but yeah, that's about the last thing I posted. And, you know, since then, it's really uh, about the projects. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, do, do those uh, exercises, but then... Okay focus on your project when are you slated to present uh two weeks from yeah, like, uh, two weeks from today two weeks yeah okay good um what remind me your topic i've got it down but I've, uh this uh, electron microscope scanning electron oh, microscope. Right, okay yeah actual, actual uh, application of it as opposed to yeah that's that's nice clear quantum stuff yeah yeah that'll that'll be uh uh, that's that's a good topic. It's about the right panel levels. <laughs> some of these things, like today's, there's uh, some complicated physics going on in that uh, that kind of topic. You know, it's uh, it's it's good to you know rush with it, but you know it it takes uh, it takes a lot of digging to get really conversant in yeah. in a topic like that. Sometimes that stuff is so far beyond me that I don't even know how to formulate a question about it. Yeah, yeah, I I know, uh, and um, yeah, there there actually weren't a whole lot of questions on that, probably for that very reason. Uh, you know, like where do you get a toehold on uh, some real physics? And uh, you know, I'll, I'll take that into account. Um, you know, I, I do want everybody to try to ask something, but it's, it's just not always practical. And then I rambled on for 20 minutes and <laughs> it's stuff that time that, you know, somebody might have thought of a question. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's good to go back and forth between, you know, something where you can do a real calculation and ask real questions and compute answers. And uh, this, uh, you know, far flung, heady wild idea kind of arena uh, that, you know, often if you're, you know, right in the thick of it, you know, comes out of a concrete calculation, but, you know, it might take you five years to be at a level where you can do that calculation. So, um, uh, you know, going back and forth between those, you know, keeping up with some of the far flung ideas that may one day become standard uh, kinds of investigation and uh, you know doing things that one can actually compute you, you want to spend I don't know you know 90 percent of your time doing something that you could really do with you know 10 percent oh, looking at uh, looking at these cool things um, that you know may be around forever may not be around after another month. <laughs> You never quite know. Uh, so um, let's see. Yeah, we're mostly here, right? So let's let's pick up right where we left off. Um, any quantum field theory questions? Uh, having had a little time to digest um, that, uh, well, that weirdness about um, you know uh, eliminating all of the particles and getting a vacuum expectation value, um, you know, that's, that's probably the hardest step. Then now uh, there, are, there are things that are you know, more straightforward as, you know, calculationally speaking, you're not having to keep such careful track of whether you can differentiate the field with respect to time or not anyway. Uh, but what I want to look at is this product rule that we, Last time got a differential equation for this. Uh, it's a product of two exponentiated Hamiltonians, the interaction one and the full Hamiltonian, and it satisfies a differential equation that 
drives it by the interaction Hamiltonian, which is uh, a sandwich of um, uh, free particle uh, Hamiltonian uh, time evolution operators. Uh, which is this U of T one, T one. That's a comma. That's a comma. There we go. Okay, so uh, we we want to look at this, but now look what happens if we multiply by uh, another u here, uh, say t1 to t0, or taking t0 to t1, and put the same thing here, t1 to t0. And so imagine u of t1, t0. And that's not affected by the time derivative here. But now, if I define this product to be V of, uh, let me see how I, T, T1, T0, then um, the same equation applies to, to V. So I'm defining V to be that product. Uh, so, V is U of T comma T1 times U of T1 comma T0. But DDT of V, I mean, this is V here, that is V over there. So it still satisfies this equation. And so uh, we can write that as uh, the a, a time ordered a, yeah time ordered exponential h bar uh, integral of the interaction Hamiltonian uh, that's the general solution to that equation and then if you look at um, if you set t zero to uh, if you set t to t0, that squeezes t1 to be t0. Each of these is one. So v0 is actually equal to one. And now um, this is, uh, that's the same initial condition that u satisfies. So in fact, uh, this, this means that v is u of t, t0. And since V is defined as U of T, T1, and U of T1, T0. We have a product rule for the time evolution operator. And now, this, remember, this is not exactly the time evolution operator that we use in quantum mechanics, where you exponentiate the full Hamiltonian. This one is... Uh, this, this one is a combination of the exponential of the free Hamiltonian and the full Hamiltonian, which really makes it dependent uh, crucially on the interaction here. And you know, this is the thing we're really going to be interested in. So given that, now we can look at this vacuum expectation value that we've been, uh, we've, we've massaged our our, our, our initial to uh, the final transition element into a bunch of stuff acting on a vacuum expectation value of the time ordered product of a bunch of fields. And uh, let me see how to write this. Um, it's uh, phi of y1 up to phi hat of x, uh, N or M, I forget which we use for this, but uh, it's a vacuum expectation value. That's the thing we're interested in. And what we're going to do is uh, write this in terms of uh, a bunch of these U factors together with uh, a bunch of, of um, interaction picture fields. So we can write each field phi of say y and t as a, a, a pair of u dagger and u. 
the dagger of t t zero and phi and I think this is phi i now for the u of t and t naught and then uh, yeah that's right. this is this is the same y but uh, time t naught so. <clears throat> We're, we're writing the field at any time t as uh, the unitary transformation of the interaction picture field at time t naught. And now we're gonna substitute things like that into this uh, field product. And that, that gets really long. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think if there's some way I can uh, abbreviate this. This expression, you can, you can see what's happening. But uh, let's see. So this product is going to be time-ordered product. That's like some fancy Quick question t. about that product. Yes. Do we mean to be using both x and y in that expression? Well, we don't have to. Uh, you know, at, at this point, I. Um, I had been thinking of the initial uh, fields as dependent on X's and the final fields as dependent on Y's, but you can call them all X from one to M plus N, yeah. if you like. It doesn't make any so, difference to what we're doing. So at some point I'm gonna be just calling them all X. And uh, you know, the, um, the important thing is, well, the time order. Right, so for, for any given argument in here, uh, you know, one of the, this is a four vector, there's a time coordinate, and uh, is that time earlier or later than the time associated with this four vector position? That's, that's all that matters. It doesn't matter whether you call them X or Y here. So I guess what I'm struggling with is, uh, yeah, what to put for the ellipsis. What's the next, is the next one a Y? Two or is it an X one? Oh, okay. The um, the incoming part. Let, let me get the notation that I had uh, initially here for for the matrix element. Yeah, I had um, yeah n m initial particles and m final particles. So so this this goes to X sub m and. Uh, the last y here is y m, sorry, y n, and then the next one would be x one. Yeah, that explains it. So a total of n plus m terms. That's right. That's right. And uh, let's see. Yeah, I. Um, well. Uh, I'm, gonna I, I've, I'm happy I'm with it now. With yeah. I'm happy uh, with the ellipsis too. It's it's fine. I just yeah to, yeah for sure. Yeah, it's, it's important to know what those things do. I should have stuck in a couple more, but the thing already was running three lines. So I'm gonna stick. Uh, yeah, for the sake of brevity. That yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks for understanding. Right. So I've got a. All right. Now, how do, how do I write these guys? You know, it it might actually be easier if we could just talk about um, you know some some total of total number here. And I don't think we'll get in trouble for this calculation if if we just call these all um, some uh, let's say y uh, uh, you know up to up to some total number. Let me call it capital N. Uh, that might simplify what we're writing here. So <laughs> otherwise we have two one indices and two two indices and so on. Um, so um, so we, we want to bring everything from time t0. So if I write t1, uh, t0 here, um, now, now one is the time for y1 and n is going to be the time for N1. So it's, it's actually easier for this calculation to make those all the same. Then we have a phi of y1, phi i of y1. And then, uh, which side? This was a dagger here, I think. 
Um, okay, then zero. And then we have another one, dagger uh, T2, T0, phi I of Y2, U of T2 and T0 times a whole lot of similar things until we get down there. I, I want to get I need to keep track of the first and last. The, the interior things, there's, we're gonna use that combination rule on the interior things. But let me uh, keep track of the last one here. So we're gonna have a U dagger from T sub, what I'm calling capital N for the purposes of this calculation. Phi I at Y N. <coughs> times u of t n t zero and a vacuum state. Okay, so we have this big long chain of things that uh, the, the u's come in pairs and uh, now, uh, let me see, um, we, can, we can immediately use, uh, combine half the u's because, um, the uh, this this combination here is uh, right. Let's see. U dagger just puts these in the opposite order. So this this is the same as U T one T two. And so between each uh, pair of phi's, we can we can coalesce the two the two products. Uh, did I do? Yeah, I did that right. So. Um, you know, this is equal to U T1 T0, then this U dagger is the same as U T0 T2. And, and, and then those combined by the product. So now, uh, let's see, um, I've introduced one, uh, one extreme time. Um, now, I'm not sure if this is a necessary step, but what I want to do is write uh, write this first one, u dagger of t1 t0 as as a product of. Let's see, it's uh, going to be u uh, All right. This, yeah, you have T0, T1. And now I can write that as U of T0, T plus times U of T plus with T1, like that. And that, that introduces a new time. And I, I'm going to take that T plus to, to be in the far future uh, eventually. So now, um, if I write that with a dagger, uh, this one is U dagger from T plus uh, to T plus from T zero. And then this one, uh, T plus T one uh, can, can stay where it is. So I, I can replace this one by, by this product here. And then doing that, this U is going to combine with this combined U. We're, we're actually going to be able to combine all of these U's. And we're allowed to move fields around in this expression because the whole thing is time ordered in any case. So no matter what order the various fields end in, the various field operators that are in the Hamiltonians and all of that, it all gets reshuffled according to the time uh, because of this overall time ordering operator. So we're allowed to bring these things together. And I think uh, basically we have, uh, it was pretty much one of every kind. Uh, let's see, so this one, the, the next, this one here is gonna combine with the next thing down the line and give us a, a T2 to T3. Uh, then there will be a T3 to T4, T4 to T5, and so on. 
So this whole thing is going to end up giving us the time ordered vacuum expectation value. Um, might as well get used to long names for things. T plus and T zero. And then uh, we get, um, there's gonna be an overall, uh, let, let, me, let me look at what this ends up being. Um, on the other end, uh, all of these collect on the other end uh, from all right, this first U of T plus. So, so we have phi, 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 um, all the phi's. And then on this end, we're gonna get another of these things because we've got, here's a U of T plus to T1, and we've got T1 to T2, T2 to T3, and so on. This is gonna end up being uh, T plus to uh, T0 as well. And then, all right, sorry if the zero doesn't fit on the board, but um, uh, vacuum expectation. So what we end up with is a sandwich of just two uh, time evolution operators over the full range. Now, oh, I have to remember what we do with this. What's, um, you know, those two factors become a full integral. So, uh, let's see here. So this U T plus T zero, uh, initial time and final time, uh, we can write that then as, uh, and I'm, I'm leaving off the time ordering because the whole thing is time ordered. So I can just write the exponential e to the minus i from minus infinity to plus infinity of the interaction Hamiltonian dt or dt prime if you don't want to be, if you want to be careful with the integration variable. So uh, now, uh, let's see, we need to, um, let's see, what is that? That's dual to the evolution of the vacuum state. Oh, okay. So yeah, the, the idea here is that uh, if we, if we look at the action of this state on the vacuum, uh, U dagger acting on, um, so this is uh, infinity minus infinity. Um, that's, that's dual to T from, wait a minute, do I have this right? Um, yeah, if we flip that. Uh, the operator acting on that vacuum, but all right, that's uh, this. This is the final vacuum, and the final vacuum is related to the initial vacuum uh, by at most a phase. So uh, the um, I can replace uh, this operator on that state by a phase. Uh, I think I need e to the minus i. So this one is the initial u the i alpha on the initial vacuum state. I'm sorry. There you go. Um, so the the time evolution of that state is just is going to change that vacuum state by as most of things. This thing's not creating particles in itself. So <clears throat> uh, when I take the dagger, I get the opposite phase. So I can put e to the minus i alpha here and drop that initial time evolution. Now, the other time evolution operator is exactly the one we want. So what, we're, what we've done here is to write the whole thing as, uh, now where do I wanna put it? Um, So our vacuum expectation value, we can now write as 
the vacuum expectation of the time ordered product of phi of y1 through phi of y capital N times this time evolution minus i full time integral of the interaction Hamiltonian, uh, let me call this dt prime, like that. And then the vacuum. Okay. This is getting very close to what we need. All right. Uh, these are now interaction picture fields. And the whole time evolution of this thing has, has been socked into this interaction of Hamiltonian. Otherwise, these guys evolve as free fields. We know the solution for free fields. So the, uh, the, all of the scattering happens as a result of this term here. This is gonna be expanded in a Taylor series and term by term, give us Feynman diagrams to sort out. Uh, each of these will be, uh, let's see, what do we end up doing with it? Well, yeah, everything. Uh, the interaction of Hamiltonian, remember, is in fact generally polynomial in the fields. This is gonna be a product of fields too. And any power of that is some product of fields. So we are always going to be evaluating vacuum expectation values of products of fields, of, of free fields. Um, and uh, those are going to boil down to uh, something, uh, let's see, um, it's, it's gonna boil down to Feynman propagators. The, the thing we need to do next is to prove Wick's theorem. Uh, what um, uh, the idea of Wick's theorem is uh, not too hard. We, we have these fields all time ordered, but that's not the most useful way to write them. Uh, Wick's theorem uh, basically allows us to relate uh, a time ordered or any ordered product of these fields to um, uh, some combinations of, uh, uh, let's see, of normal ordered fields and propagators. So let's take a let's take a look at how that works. So this is good. This is this is really where we want this expression to be. Um, the the only thing that we have to do is now is. Uh, Wick's theorem is going to let us replace products of fields by products of propagators. A propagator, well, we've encountered propagators before as green functions, uh, but it turns out that uh, they can also be written as, I'll, I'll leave this up as long as I can so we can just sort of bask in having that. Uh, if we have a product of fields, so let's take phi I of y1, phi I of something, y2. Um, now, each of these free fields we know can be written as uh, a Fourier series and, uh, well, there's some powers of two pi here. Uh, we've been writing three halves, but um, perhaps you know putting six there is uh, what we might end up doing. But uh, the, the important thing is here that we have a e to the minus uh, i <coughs> p dot y a dagger e to the i. Why. So there's a, an annihilation part and a creation part. And 
basically, I just want to be able to think of that as a phi minus and a phi plus. Okay, so if I act with a phi minus on this vacuum state, I get zero, All right? And that's the crucial thing we uh, are gonna make good use of to simplify this field expression because what we wanna do is take this product of fields and rearrange them with uh, into normal ordered uh, sets of fields so that all the annihilation operators are on the far right and annihilate that vacuum state. That's gonna, that's gonna vastly simplify what happens because all that's gonna be left are the commutators. And uh, concretely in the, um, uh, in this example, all right, I can write this as a, let me, let me just say phi one plus plus phi one minus phi two plus plus phi two minus. And that's, that's almost already normal order. Uh, the problem is this one here. So I can write this as uh, the, uh, the, the, only, the only part of this that's not normal ordered is we need to flip those two. And so uh, I can write this as the normal ordered product of phi one with phi two uh, plus the commutator of phi one minus with phi two plus. And now let's see, that's, um, all right, if I, if I added the phi one to make this a full phi one here, uh, that wouldn't matter because the pluses commute. Let's see, if I put the minus part here, uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't hurt anything because whatever order I write the minuses in, uh, it's, it's going to be, um, it's already normal ordered. Two minuses are already normal ordered. So I can write, I can write this field product as a normal ordered product plus a commutator of the two fields. So, now we want to do that with an arbitrary number of fields and that's the content of Wick's theorem. So uh, before we do that, let's look at what that commutator actually is. Because it's a little bit surprising, maybe not too. I've already, I've just erased the fields, but. If, if we look at phi one, we, we don't have to do this step actually. We can just look at phi one minus with phi two plus. And that's a commutator. Well, uh, what did we have? We have a bunch of two pi's out here. Uh, we have a D3P, D3Q, let's say over um, root uh, four EP Q. And then we're going to end up with a commutator of um, what do we need? A, uh, let's call it A1 with um, the dagger from A2, E to the I, let's see, P dot Y1 minus P dot Y1 uh, plus I. Q dot Y two. Yeah, there we go. Uh, but something like that. Now this this commutator is is a delta of um, Y one minus Y two. So now um, that lets us do one of the integrals and uh, carefully preserving our lovely result here. Uh, this is going to be one over two pi cubed. And we got the board. Yeah. Um, we're still going to have one integral left, d3, d3p over twice the energy. Um, the square root goes away here. And then we have um, e to the 
minus I P minus Q dot of, wait, sorry. The, the, delta, the delta functions, uh, this is between P's, not, this is P minus Q. So this delta function is gonna be minus I P um, Y1 minus Y2 like this. And that integral, uh, that's exactly what we got for the Feynman propagator for the green function way back in chapter five. Uh, that's, that's exactly that leftover integral after we've pulled out the, the um, step functions in time, uh, we ended up with an integral just like this. So I'm pointing the wrong way because I, I see it on my notes there too. Uh, so this thing is worth giving a name. We're gonna call it D, probably D plus of uh, Y1 minus Y2. That's the Feynman propagator. And uh, we're, for the most part, going to write those, uh, and I'm, here's, here's where I'm definitely going to adopt a new normalization uh, and a careful definition of the thing we're going to be using a lot. We want the Fourier transform of, of this thing. So what we end up uh, writing is, Uh, if you go back to chapter five, you'll see we have exactly this kind of form. But uh, if we if we write it now with a two pi to the fourth, or no, uh, we're we're just looking at the transform of this now. Um, it's uh, momentum momentum intervals. I'm going to run out of space here. So um, D, D4K, yeah. And uh, K alpha, yes, M squared. Uh, and then the exponential. So uh, we're, we're going to be uh, writing these commutators, the, the plus minus creation annihilation commutators that lead to this integral. Um, we're going to be writing this uh, basically in this form, but as a four dimensional integral uh, with the energy denominator, uh, quite often we'll remind ourselves that this is actually a, a contour integral that we do to, to evaluate that. So then this four dimensional integral includes those step functions. So um, now to yeah, remind yourself from, uh, take a look back at chapter five, where we, uh, we actually started with that sort of thing and did contour integrals of it. Now, Professor, yes, question. yeah, Alex. That, when that epsilon exists, is that is that off shell? Is that is that when it's holding off shell? Is, oh, is yeah. oh, all of this is off shell? Yeah, okay. um, you know, if we're in the interaction region, everything's off shell, right? It's only asymptotically it gets re restored to uh, to free fields. So, yeah, yeah. We're off shell. We're we're in the complexified um, time plane, uh, and we've the i epsilon is is pushing the poles off the real axis so that we can do a closed contour integral. And uh, so often we'll be writing this with an i epsilon here just to remind ourselves that you know this is uh, uh, this is to be evaluated at you know arbitrary stuff in the complex plane. So yeah, I don't uh, even really know what those terms mean. Did that so 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 is um is is like off shell does that does that was that when we're doing this time ordering trick? Is that what that means? Or I don't even really know what those mean, but 
No, well, time ordering is no time ordering is different, right? Uh, time ordering, uh, you know, a field is, um, you know, uh, the argument, uh, the arguments of a field. You've got, uh, you've got four vectors, you know, x alpha. Well, there's a time there. So is that time earlier or later than the time in this one? And the time ordering operator looks just at that and reorders the fields uh, so that later times are further to the left. The, uh, let's see, yeah, I've been fretting about the normalization here, but you know, it's just a normalization. The, the thing that's um, crucial in Wick's theorem is that this, uh, this product of fields that we had initially up here can now be written this way. So if we've got a phi of y1, uh, let me just say a phi of, a phi of x, the phi of y, I can write that as a normal ordered product phi i of x, plus d of x minus y. And yeah, sometimes, uh, sometimes we'll, we'll worry about a plus or minus here, whether that's a, because um, remember that the green function turns out to be a sum of two pieces. There are two poles here. And one of those poles gave us the, positive energy, future oriented uh, green function. And the other pole gives us the um, negative energy uh, past oriented uh, green function. Um, you know, for, for most of what we're doing here, that's, uh, that sign is not going to be important. Uh, what's crucial here is that this product of fields can be written as a normal order product of fields plus a propagator. And the vacuum expectation value of this is then what? The normal ordering gives zero. So it's just the propagator like that. Uh, uh, this, this is a function. So the states just come together and you've got the norm of the vacuum state, which is one. So, so this vacuum expectation value of a product of two fields becomes a function. And we've, uh, we've eliminated two of the fields. So let's see, next thing is the full blown Wick's theorem to do this for an arbitrary number of fields. So let's uh, let's take a deep breath and um, contemplate that. Oh, so let's see here. This is written as a Fourier transform, but we're often interested in just uh, right. So just uh, this argument without the exponential. Uh, the uh, we can write d of p as the Fourier transform of the x minus y thing is just uh, everything else. So one over two pi to the fourth, i over uh, this difference. So e squared minus p squared, this is e of p. Um, well, no, it's not. Uh, minus m squared plus i epsilon. Uh, it's, it's in momentum space that we're gonna end up writing writing this. Um, and then uh, everything is accompanied by a whole bunch of exponentials and integrals, which we do in the end. Now, uh, Alex, your question about on shell and off shell. Uh, it's, it's off shell until we get on shell. And there's a pole here. But remember, in our full expression for pulling all the momenta out of the um, initial and final states, we had we had this wave operator box plus m squared uh, for each uh, initial and final momentum, and uh, 
those, those give zeros that are exact inverses to these poles. So each of those box plus M factors is going to exactly cancel the um, asymptotic limit of this factor as it goes back on shell. So we're, we're not going to see any effect of those asymptotic regions. This is like canceling the legs of the Feynman diagram, the incoming stuff and the outgoing stuff. Uh, it all cancels between this denominator of the propagator and that wave operator. We'll in fact write that wave operator as a k squared plus m or minus k squared plus m squared for, for each incoming and outgoing momentum k. So, okay. I can yes. ask a question. Yes, please. To see if uh, I, I haven't heard this on or off shell terminology before, and I'm just curious if my intuition has anything to do with it. Uh, is, this a, is this a question of whether or not we're dealing with the poly exclusion principle or if we're just dealing with field interactions? Uh, uncertainty is closer. Um, you know, uh, for, for um, differences in uh, energy or position uh, that violate the uncertainty relation, we, we can't say anything about those. So uh, we can have violations of conservation of um, momentum, let's say, as long as the, the fluctuation of the momentum times our uncertainty in, uh, in Stay, position- it Stays it, down like, in that H bar range. H-bar. Yeah, stays within the bounds of that where you know, we have no information. Right, so uh, off shell is when the, you know, the momentum is not being conserved. So, you know, when, when we look at some scattering processes, like, uh, let's see, can you see this? Um, you, you've got, uh, say, two electrons that exchange a photon, but on the way, they pair produce and it annihilates. Well, uh, this, um, uh, the amount of momentum going around this can be arbitrarily high. You, uh, you know, there's, there's no measurable consequence of the amount of momentum that is going around that. Uh, you, you don't have to uh, conserve momentum except at the vertices. And then what we'll find is the overall uh, total energy and momentum are conserved. We'll see that in every calculation we do. Uh, but the, the actual momentum that is flowing around inside of these diagrams is arbitrary. Uh, that's off shell. So off shell is when K squared is not equal to M squared. Basically any time these two are not the same, that's called off shell. Uh, and then the, the mass shell, uh, the mass shell is basically an invariant length of, of that inner product. So you're on mass shell when k squared is equal to m squared. And that's, that's a solution to the vacuum equation. In the interaction region, you know, we don't, we don't know that that's the case. In fact, we know that's not the case because particles are inter interacting. So their, their wave vector is not given by k squared equals m squared. It's not a free field. So you're solving some more complicated equation. And we're doing it here perturbatively uh, in a fairly controlled way so that we can actually compute it. But you know, to, to solve the, like the full, for the full uh, state in the middle of an interaction, that's uh, really fairly, uh, fairly hopeless endeavor. That's a very complicated thing. So, so in our, in our case behind us, it's like we're it's like we're taking a square root of this i epsilon and then adding it into like like a vector square and then adding it onto the momenta. So we're we're like what you know, we're yeah, uh, yeah. the mass shell would be doing the same thing for the mass term, um, uh, right? Versus seeing it seeing it as off off mass shell versus off of momentum shell or something. Is that kind of the language? I don't know the sign. Uh, Momentum shell. Uh, yeah, well, you, you can you can write an expression like this as you know, k alpha is um, 
you know. Yeah, that, that's uh, just just know, as a weighty, handy way to see it as a momentum bump. Uh, something plus some small thing like that, yeah. and uh, you know, then relate this to to that offset. You can certainly do that. And and uh, so then in yeah we're, yeah the so you know we're 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 integrating this thing uh, where where we've complexified the energy space, right? And so, you know, the, you know, we're, we're going around some, some loop that we can arbitrarily deform, right? The, as long as we close the loop, we're, we're gonna get, uh, we're, we're gonna pick out just the pole, but in doing that, we're actually integrating over uh, every real value of the energy. Uh, that that may be one way to see the the off shellness of all of this, um, and, and then the interaction picture is inherently off shell because because everybody's like momentum, their annihilation and creation operators are acting on each other when it's not time ordered. So in general, the momentum in the the intermediate state won't be exactly on shell because it'll have part of its momentum will be on the other on shell particles momentum right like everybody's yeah, mixed right, together, right. So. yeah everybody's momentum is mixed here right? brilliant you've got n plus m particles whatever that is or capital n particles uh and then when you expand this hamiltonian uh exponential you you bring in more products of particles and so the contribution at any given level you know comes from this expectation value uh, which, um, yeah, you know, the, uh, it's only the total momentum of the whole thing that is conserved. You have no idea what any one uh, constituent particle's momentum is during the interaction. You know, what, what we do is it's a path integral picture where we're summing over every possibility. You know, now it's weighted. It's weighted by uh, a, an imaginary exponential, a phase. Uh, and that phase can be changing fast enough that contributions cancel out. But uh, we are, um, you know, I, I think uh, having recourse to a path integral picture is really useful. Um, now, I don't know if you've been through a derivation of the path integral, but what you do is you, you infinitesimally implement this, uh, this exponentiated Hamiltonian from some initial wave function to some final wave function. And what you find is that uh, the, the answer for prob the probability of going from here to here uh, amounts to um, an integral over all space at every time. And what you're summing up is, okay, the, the, the you know, position at this time is here and the next moment it's over there and the next moment it's over here, it could be, any path at all from here to there is going to contribute in to this weighted average uh, that actually gives you the finite time evolution of the field. I find that a very useful picture for thinking about what's going on. Where um, you know, once once these particles enter the interaction region, uh, the you know basically anything can happen. So every possible way of writing an interaction between these particles uh, could be going on. And the correct answer says that in some appropriate measure, it is going on. Everything, every, uh, every kind of exchange that we can draw of this sort, um, as many vertices as you like, as many photons and things as you like, the correct answer seems to be, uh, a weighted sum of all of those things. So, you know, this perturbation method, you know, it's, it's like, okay, you know, suppose we've got, you know, this uh, waveform on a string, you know, just some specific thing. Now, we can write that as a Fourier series. So it's a whole bunch of sine waves added together. Well, is it any one sine wave? No, it is, it is the whole sum. It's this very particular thing that's very hard to describe if we don't write it as a sum of sine waves because you know we can work with the sum of sine waves, we can work with the perturbation theory, we can work with epicycles in the Ptolemaic 
solar system, right? Ptolemy's model can explain anything. It's just the Fourier series. But, uh, you know, what's the actual orbit? Well, turns out, hey, an ellipse. And there's a simpler way to get at that whole thing. Maybe one of you will be the one to discover, oh, you know, I can write this whole state exactly in some vastly simpler way. Well, good luck, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, that would be great. Um, but uh, we don't have a way to do that. What we have is a perturbation method that lets us uh, add together this sort of epicycle uh, together with a bunch of other epicycles. And never forget, it gives us 12 significant figures um, with about three months of computer time. Uh, you know, it's, uh, these, these, get, these get quite complicated but they give very, very accurate answers. So, uh, other questions? Yeah, uh, nice pause here to catch up. I guess, um, I guess so, so I guess the interaction picture is kind of taking place in like the free algebra of sorts of the basis states. Like we're just, we're taking general oh, tensor yeah. products of everything, yeah. right? Yeah, so nice. yeah, these inter these inner products are free fields. And yeah, so products of those, yes, that's absolutely the free algebra of the interaction picture free fields. Um, but it's so, so like, <laughs> like, oh, there's a sea of particles in the vacuum is kind of like saying like, there's a huge number of irreducible states on the product or on the, on the free algebra of a field state. Is that some, some way to say that? Like, like the, um, yeah. Okay, yeah, to say there is a sea of particles is to put a bit of reality where we're really talking about some perturbation method, but yeah, sure. Um, you know, the, uh, you, uh, yes, use, use this picture of, you know, isolated interactions adding together as, as if that were really happening, but in the back 5% of your mind know that what's really going on is not any one of those diagrams at all. It's, it's some complicated superposition of that whole thing. So, so, so like when you're trying to do like a, like a, like a, two, a two level diagram, like a, like a, like a second order diagram, right. is, that, is that something like you're taking the free algebra where it's all the second order products then, and then you're creating a little vector space out of like X, Y and X times Y, and then you're trying to find the irreducible representations on that little section. And then you're drawing yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's a, a, a good description. Yeah, so, you know, we, we expand out powers of the, we're gonna be doing examples of this, you know, in the next, you know, number of classes. So, you know, we'll take a specific interaction, um, power, power of phi, phi cubed or phi to the fourth for a scalar field. And, you know, we'll actually do these things, but, uh, you know, if we have a, like a phi cubed, interaction. Um, that means we can have three phi particles uh, at one vertex. Well, so we're going to add up things like that. So at second order, you could, you could have something like this, two particles in and two particles out exchanging a particle. Um, you know, that would be a phi cubed interaction at second order um, because you have two vertices. So at, at first order, um, well, with a phi fourth at first order, can you see this? Um, you, you could have two particles come in and two particles go out and there's one vertex. So you, you get something non-trivial at first order, some non-trivial interaction. Is this what's happening? Well, evaluating this, this picture, uh, you know, in this formalism, calculating that expectation value gives you pretty good results for, you know, if you have a particle that actually has that, uh, that kind of interaction. But what's really happening is a superposition of this and this and cubic order and, and so on. You know, you can also have some pretty bizarre things. So if you've got, yeah, suppose you have a quartic interaction that does that, 
all right, that could happen. And we've got to take that kind of thing into account. Uh, and unfortunately, it gives an infinite result. And so we have to handle that infinite result. You know, this is, uh, there are a bunch of heuristics going on here. Uh, tried and true heuristics, you know, we can, we can calculate real physical results by using these methods. Uh, but, oh gosh, what's really going on? Well, you know, what's, what's really going on in the EPR? Well, it's not, you, it is wrong to say that the correlated electron and positron um, exist in a spin up state just because out here you measure a spin up state. They did not exist in a spin up state uh, prior to your making that measurement. They existed in a superposition state of which that was one possibility. And, you know, to, to, it's very easy to put wrong words on this stuff. You know, you want to talk about it. Well, you know, this, this, is, this really happened. Um, nah, nah, you know, no more than in this waveform, this sine wave happened, right? Uh, so uh, yeah, as, uh, half the challenge of doing this stuff is to talk about it correctly. So, uh, you know, so just, just just trying to interpret the Feynman diagram you drew a little bit, a little bit yeah, more sure, on the sure. one. So, so is this to say like the outgoing state on the top right? Could you say this like in this free space algebra, or, or uh, no, in the in the three diagram to the left, uh, that one? Yeah. So the, would that with that one? Yeah. Would that would that just say like so the top right out particle? Could you then say that it's in like the free subspace algebra of phi times the interaction phi plus the phi to the bottom right? Like, like is it like something like a, see I'm saying then like a phi, a phi times phi plus a phi, like like a phi, that, that phi interaction if we labeled it all differently. So, so it looks like this body would be an, a combination of like a second order free, free algebra base and a first order free algebra base. Is that kind of how to see the, the yeah. You see what I'm saying? So like the fourth, the fourth uh, no, one no, would be- I'm not getting it, I'm sorry. Uh, the fourth, the fourth body diagram would be like a sum of vectors. The, the, the fourth order first, first order. So the, the, the four, the, uh, a fourth order interaction term to first order, a four body interaction, that's like a sum of vectors, right? Summing up vectors. Well, no, it's calculating a vacuum expectation value of a product of, uh, two in particles, two out particles, and one four. So uh, this uh, contributes a vacuum expectation value of four of eight fields to the transition amplitude for two scalar particles going into two other scalar particles. Um, okay. You, you want to write that as some sort of vector, not, not exactly clear to me how to do that. Good. I'll just digest it. This is just new to me. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And um, yeah, uh, we can keep trying to say these things, right? And, you know, uh, expressing it in any sort of language is, uh, is fruitful to, as an aid to understanding. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, let, let's look at a couple examples of Wick's theorem. So we've, we've done one, and I, I want to write down a couple more so you see how complicated which theorem actually gets. Uh, but that's, yeah, all we actually have time for today is to see how complicated it gets. Um, so what we've shown is phi one, phi two can be written as normal ordered phi one, phi two plus uh, let me just call this D12, okay, the propagator. So let's abbreviate our notation a bit. So now if we look at a product of three fields, then uh, let's see, what is the, uh, yeah, yeah, we're right. Um, so I could write this as phi one times uh, normal order product of phi two, phi three, 
plus a d to three. And then um, the phi one as uh, I can write as phi one plus plus phi one minus. Uh, and now we have to, you know, we, we really want to write this as phi one, phi two, phi three, normal order uh, plus, plus stuff. But, you know, what has to happen, uh, right, the, this phi with the d23, well, phi d23 is just a function. That's not a problem. But the, uh, the tricky bit is um, moving this phi minus past that normal ordered thing. And what we're going to get when we do that, uh, there's there's going to be uh, there's there's going to be a d one two when these two pass, and there will be a phi three with that. There's going to be a d one three and a phi two, and uh, we've already gotten a uh, d two three with a phi one. So uh, it, it actually ends up being exactly this, you know, that, that in fact is the answer, but it took me like uh, what, three lines of commuting things and tracking things carefully, which, okay, you, you guys are reading the book, right? You, you're up with this. So, um, you know, I'm on page 213 and, and I worked through this in detail and it, it does in fact give you this. Uh, the general pattern, yeah, and I, I've got another example with four, and I managed to keep that down to, you know, what, uh, two, four, six, eight, ten lines. Um, so, you know, not too bad. You can, you can follow that. But what you really want to do is an iterative proof of this. The thing that happens and gives you which theorem, the, the statement of which theorem, is let's, let's see if I can state it at least. The um, if if we've got a product, let's let's try let's try four fields. So we're going to write this as the normal ordered product of all four. But what happens then is each thing passes each other thing. So we're gonna get uh, normal ordered products of pairs like phi one, phi two with a D three, four. And uh, there are gonna be a bunch of those where we have normal ordered products of pairs with uh, commutators from the other ones. And then we're gonna have uh, terms where we end up with two commutators uh, that give us two, uh, or yeah, two commutators give us two propagators. And this happens every possible way. D24, or you're going to have a D14 with a D23. And uh, yeah, that's, um, yeah. The, the one the one can pass a two or a three or a four and then the other one's what's left whatever's left so this turns out to be the reduction of uh, a product of four fields and this is the general pattern that you get you get the normal ordered product of the whole bunch of them uh, plus uh, normal 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 orderings with two fewer fields and one D in every possible combination. Then you get a uh, normal ordered product of four, four. So if you have, you know, 20 fields here, uh, you know, this will be, uh, yeah. So this will be 20, this will be 18. Then you'll have 16 with pairs of uh, propagators. And then you'll have 14 with 
triples of propagators, and they occur in each possible combination exactly once. And you know that's what you then try to prove by uh, an iterative proof, uh, a proof by induction. And uh, it ends up in the end with a row that uh, this will have all products of 10 propagators uh, in the list with no normal ordered field products. When we take the ex expectation value, all of the normal ordered products die. These are, these, these are just functions. So uh, they don't interfere with the vacuum expectation value of any of the normal ordered products. So all the normal ordered stuff goes away and you're left with this maximal set of products of propagators, which is the, the final expectation value. So the, the vacuum expectation value of these fields, time ordered though they may be, is going to end up being just uh, these products, this uh, just just those operator products. So uh, this gives uh, this is going to reduce these um, these multiple field products that they get very high order very quickly. Remember, if if we've got say we've got two fields coming in two fields going out and this exponential of the interaction of Hamiltonian, which is a product of four fields. So then we've got fourth powers to, to the K at Kth order. And we're interested in vacuum expectation values of this. So the matrix element is gonna, is a, we still have a whole bunch of integrals and a whole bunch of wave operators but they act on this, this gets replaced by, uh, what is it, um, 4K plus four, uh, 4K plus four, four times K plus one, um, divided by two, so 2K plus two propagators uh, by Wick's theorem. And the details of Wick's theorem, uh, they're probably actually going to be easier for you to read through uh, in my notes. So I, I do, I do up to four products um, completely in the notes, um, and argue through to to get this result. Can we see uh, that bottom line again? Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so the product of four fields without any interaction is just a sum of uh, these three pairs of propagators. So when, um, and yeah, what, what we find from this one is then when we act with all the other stuff, uh, the, um, the result is zero because nothing is scattered here. There's been no interaction, it's only it's only the first order interaction that actually gives you something. We've already zeroed out the, the case where the particles come in and go out without interacting. So um, higher and higher order, you get more and more products of, of Ds up to um, 2K plus one at Kth order. And, uh, you know, then then, then we'll look at what, what happens when you write out those Ds and start actually doing some, uh, computing that final matrix element. And, and we'll do a bunch of examples of that. Uh, I don't know how much uh, detail you guys want to see in the proof of Wick's theorem. Um, why don't I make that an assignment for Monday? Read through um, my inductive argument and uh, what I give is, uh, you know, it's, it's somewhere between an argument and a proof. Uh, you can see what's happening, um, you know, and in light of the examples I work out in the pages before, uh, you, can, you can see that it's right. And uh, I, I think what I give is enough of a proof, shall we say. Uh, 
without developing some specialized language to talk about these things that uh, we can then start with the very simplest of Feynman diagrams next week. So um, questions? So this, this first door, so, so um, yeah, just this example behind on the board, um, on the yeah. first order of the three fields, then the first order calculation for three fields looks something like we're, we're propagating each of the field locations in the direction of, uh, of the, where the other fields are located. So we've got like a, I guess I'm viewing a tetrad and we're propagating like three is going from the along, propagating along one to two. Yeah, so yeah, this diagram with no interaction would end up looking like one going to uh, one in and one out, uh, two in and two out. It, it would be something like this. Um, so, and, yeah. and we've we've already uh, set such things to zero. So our formalism will give us zero. Where you know where we are calculating uh, an expectation of the scattering matrix. We wrote this as uh, one plus it. Remember doing that, and uh -huh. we've thrown out these. These are going to give us zero when we evaluate these matrix elements. So what we're actually looking at is an expectation of that uh, that that t matrix, the non-trivial part. So um, the contribution of this diagram is zero. There's another diagram we could draw where one goes to four and this doesn't interact, just goes to three. And so two, two to three, you, you don't know which is which, but they're both non-interacting and give zero. Yeah, and so they, I guess they give, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, they, they give zero by virtue of those wave operators, right? The box plus M squareds uh, that we got a whole <laughs> bunch of turn into K squared plus M squareds. And since there's no scattering, uh, those, those are just satisfied by the free fields. And those are what ultimately give us zero for, for this unscattered case. And the first scattering in a five fourth interaction, we have four more fields here. We're gonna have products of four propagators. And uh, um, now only certain of those are gonna to correspond to meaningful diagrams. But at first order of five fourth interaction, uh, uh, you know, really can only be one thing. You know, it's if we've got, uh, I forget how I ended up numbering these, maybe three, four, and one, two, which is, I know, pathological of me, but that's just what happened in my number. But uh, let's see, this. Um, involves, uh, let me think that, yeah, there's, there's a, like a Y5 here um, that gives the location of the interaction. So you've got a D35, a D45, uh, a D51, and a D52. I, I think, you know, basically that's the only product of propagators that actually can correspond to a, a sensible interaction, given that the one, two go out and the three, four go in. So you know, there are some limits to uh, which of these products actually corresponds to some, uh, some possible process given the other constraints on the problem. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, to kind of like, to kind of visualize it as a, because a, because I'm seeing these products as I'm trying to say them as product a, a propagators of propagators, but like I don't know if that's like the picture that's drawing me to that is just so in the first in the first order like three field interaction term yeah. right behind you where we have like the sum of d one two of phi three is that is that just saying that on the first order each is propagating like in the free field of all the others like it looks like. It looks like we're just propagating the like propagating the the phi three here. Um, yeah. yeah. So the along a different propagator. The two possibilities yeah, here. This would be a D13, D24. 
And we also had a D, um, wait a minute, no, this is, oh, sorry, two, three. That's one, two, three, okay. One, four. But we also had where this one was the one, three and a D, two, four. Yeah, yeah, and that one was the trivial one. Yeah, so there's also, you know, there was also a product D1, 2, D3, 4, but, you know, that would be this, you know, that, that doesn't, that's not relevant to the interactions we're looking at, where these are the final particles, those are the initial particles, uh, you know, nothing ever actually propagates at all. So, so we don't do this one, we do, we would do these two, both of these are zero. Um, actually, this this one's zero two, so it doesn't doesn't actually matter here. But the the the, the propagators are directly corresponding to vertices. I guess that's what I'm trying to ask. Is that true? The propagators correspond to lines. That's no, what I'm trying to say. The, like the directions are, are lines. Are the lines? Yeah, so they're like each line. So if I've got particle three going to the interaction region at y five, that that line is a d three five. And then edges. There, I think there's edges, another. Yeah. There's another thing that gets put in for the vertex. I'm sorry, yeah, fields no. are fields are vertexes, and and edges are propagators. Is that maybe the? No, the the, the, the each particle is represented uh, as long as it propagates freely is represented by a propagator. So each okay. particle we see is a propagator. Okay. Right. Then then there's an interaction that uh, has a certain probability associated with it. Yeah, so, okay, you know, we're, you, you know, uh, this, this will probably be clear once we do a few examples. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to gruelingly go through some examples of evaluating all of this. Um, and from that extract rules for saying, oh, each line gets propagator, each vertex gets this factor. And, you know, we'll, we'll go through that. Um, in in real detail. Okay, I've never. Okay, maybe. So so the particle is the vertex and the edge. The particle here is okay. is the point. Yeah, from see you here, but I know I know you guys have to go. All right. So right. yeah, uh, yeah. Have a good it's weekend. I'll see you guys on Monday. Yeah, uh, but yeah. Uh, 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 so the, the particles sorry, from. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The, say again. The, the part the particle itself is a vertex a vertex and an edge. It's like three to the center vertex. It would be the, the particle that's that's moving into the interaction. Yeah, so the, the propagator, you, you introduce a propagator for each uh, three particle line. So you, we're, we're imagining that particles travel as free particles uh, and that's mathematically characterized by the propagator until they uh, reach a vertex at which now they're doing something with other particles. So yeah. what happens here is this magical thing characterized by you know some some probability uh, amplitude that tells you what the coupling is, um, and involves involves those interaction fields. So the you know we've we've put in a phi at y five to the fourth power here uh, with you know probably a probably an I lambda over four factorial because um, these guys can interact in any order. So you factor that out uh, when you write the interaction strength. Um, but yeah, that, that kicks in a different something. Now to, to really characterize, you know, this could be happening at any point, right? So you are integrating over all positions here, but you know, it may not be the only thing that happens. You know, it could be that there's uh, another, well, I don't know, you can, you know, at fifth order, you, you, yes. you're, gonna, you're gonna have some crazy stuff like this going on also. And what's actually happening is a combination of all of that weighted. Because right. this, these are actually world lines that we're drawing. This, this is like the whole, the, this, the you know, you'd, you'd be just as close if you called it a cartoon, right? Yeah, okay. um, you know, I mean, yes, we do, we do think of time as evolving upward here. So in some sense, you know, you might think of this as a space time, dark, except we're in momentum space. So, you know, we're going from, uh, 
it's only counting in and out. So time time is parameterized by oh this interaction and then this interaction oh. and then yeah oh see I've so, always missed so, I've always yeah. tried so to the the time evolution we've pushed off to minus infinity to plus infinity and you know that's that's in the limits on this uh, interaction Hamiltonian integral. Um, but yeah, you'll see if you remember the rest of the matrix element we wrote, it involves uh, there there are a bunch of Fourier amplitudes. Yeah, let me see if I can uh, find the last place I wrote that whole thing. Um, and I will be writing it out again, but it's it had uh, a bunch of uh, yeah okay nine point seven on page two hundred six is the full thing we're after. Now, uh, can you see that? Do you have it handy? Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm so yeah, there, yeah. yeah. So you see the vacuum expectation value that turns into all these propagators. Um, each of these propagators uh, is, is going to have an exponential associated with it. And then we're integrating over all X and all Y. And each propagator has an integral over all, uh, all um, momenta. So, you know, we're going to end up with, um, you know, four to some high power number of integrals. You know, the examples I've worked out have 40 integrals, right? But they all give, they all give direct delta functions or just integrate over direct delta functions. So the integrals themselves end up being trivial and reducible to, hey, Feynman integrals. Mm -hmm. right? so, so, yeah, the, the results of all those integrations are so predictable. Um, that you know you're always going to get a two pi to the fourth times delta of the sum of all the in minus all the out momentum, right? So conservation of momentum delta uh, Dirac uh, delta, and um, you know that uh, all of those box plus m squared factors are going to uh, cancel things that turn up in the denominators of the propagators, so those are all going to cancel out. And, uh, or let's see, well, at least n plus m of those cancel out. Um, if you've got some internal loops, you've got divergent integrals uh, over the remaining poles um, from the interactions. Uh, so then we have to figure out what to do with those infinities. And there's, there's systematic, there are systematic ways of handling those. But um, we're, we are going to here slowly develop Feynman rules. And so we're going to do concrete examples of, uh, uh, where was it here? Yeah, okay, non-interacting particles. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do the zeroth order thing, right? And, and show that it really gives zero. And then, then we'll do a first order inter interaction. And you know, then we'll be flexing our wings and uh, you know, trying some you know, second and third order interactions and seeing what new features enter that we have to, we have to deal with. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, it could be next week, we'll be actually evaluating uh, some Feynman diagrams. Okay, so this is so cool. I've always been confused by Feynman diagrams. I've been reading them as time progressing, even though I knew that was wrong, but I, mm -hmm. I couldn't figure out another way to see it, but this, this whole, it, it's not a time, it, time is pushed off. This is an interaction picture. It's, it's a diagram that helps you remember what, what integrals to do. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, that's, okay. you know, this is just a mnemonic to help you get uh, right down the list of things you need to compute to do perturbation theory at third order, right? And, you know, uh, so each of these diagrams, we're going to be able to, you know, say, Draw all the diagrams at third order. Now, on each of those diagrams, label the incoming and outgoing momenta, label the vertices, you know, write the propagator for internal lines. Now, write down the product of all those things in a specific way. And now go to town, do a bunch of integrals, right? And uh, yeah, so, so we'll reduce it to some fairly simple rules for, uh, for all of that. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, getting there, you know, we're, we're st still doing a little bit of the getting there.
yeah, yeah, I'm not, but, but just I can kind of now see why, because there was a professor giving a talk at the string conference last year where they just went up on the board and started, you know, doing Feynman diagrams and then saying, oh, this is easy and, and using Feynman rules like hardcore, but they were doing, you know, yeah. string theory and stuff. So it's it's just just the fact that I'm close enough to see that is this is so cool. Thank you so much, Professor. Oh, you bet. You bet. So neat. So, oh, so yeah, read read through Wick's theorem and I, uh, have you read this chapter yet? I, I I was I was like right where we are at the lecture today. I'm no farther than we are today. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. Read the proof of Wick's theorem, and you know, if you have any questions on that, I think, you know, if you if you study the examples and just work through those ten lines in detail, you'll see enough of the process that the proof will, will be pretty clear, you know. And yeah. it's it's an inductive proof, um, and you know, then we just get to throw out all those. Uh, normal ordered bits and now we're now we're writing propagators for those matrix elements yeah uh yeah yeah i'll be um this has me wanting to do well all of this does but get my algebraic geometry back out because presumably uh -huh. a lot of this is nice because we're in klein gordon like maybe this is all really nasty in dirac you know uh, it's it's a little more complicated i uh i wouldn't say it's really nasty in dirac it's it's that you know the propagator has gamma matrices in it so the propagator is one over the dirac equation right it's one over p slash minus m well really that's p slash plus m over some you know p squared minus m squared thing right yeah. you, you know it's like putting uh you know one over some complex number you multiply by the conjugate and put the conjugate on top Right, so you do the same thing with the Dirac equation, but then you have a bunch of gamma matrices in this matrix product, right? And now, by the time you square the matrix element to calculate a probability and uh, insert um, uh, some of those, uh, say you want to, you know, project a certain spin, so you stick in some of those projection operators to characterize the initial and final states, you you end up with a big uh, product of gamma matrices, and you get the trace of it. the trace okay. of the, the trace of the product squared, right? So you can end up with a lot of gamma matrices, but you get good at uh, at taking traces of gamma matrices. And ultimately, we're going to put that squared matrix element into a differential cross section, and you know integrate out everything except the angles. And now we'll be predicting scattering angles of uh, actual particle experiments, right? So, you know, we're, yeah. So, yeah, we're going to make this into literal predictions for what comes out of particle ex accelerators. Oh, then we could, we could like predict the, that's enough to do like the, the beta mixing angle or whatever, right? Like the, what is that? No, double, that's, that's the okay. double, I mean, double. You know, that gets into electro week. And, you know, I mean, you know, maybe mid-july we'll be looking at that you but, know but i mean but then but then like like if we've done it with Durant, like just disintegrate out we're like we just have to gauge it kind of like big problem but yeah that's like so, so, so close okay, okay so before that what we'll be predicting will be something like uh uh, uh electron electron scattering right just you know electron electron scattering at um lowest order you, you recover the coulomb scattering formula mm -hmm. but the next order corrections to that you know so you've got you know rutherford scattering that looks like this and the actual answer looks like this at next order right mm -hmm. you know you've got you've got all these terms that depend on uh dot products of the formal momentum and stuff and the angles uh you know and their names for those formulas because people measured them back in the 50s and 60s right oh. you know, this is this is uh uh you know, Baba scattering and stuff. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, all these uh, all these different uh, kinds of scattering are, um, you know, they're evaluations of, of a bunch of Feynman diagrams. So you know, just take a deep breath, digest digest this a step at a time, 
and uh, you know we'll, we'll we'll develop that picture. Excellent! I can't wait. All right, Thank I'm very good on Alex. So you have a nice day. Good, good talking to you. Always. Okay. See you next time. Bye bye. Bye.